Welcome to The Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and that's pharmacy, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, a place for conversations that matter. And today's conversation, I think, will really matter to you. It's with Dr. Shafali, who's an extraordinary teacher. She's a psychologist. She integrates Western psychology with Eastern wisdom to bring us into an authentic life. She's a clinical psychologist. She's an international speaker, and she has written some extraordinary books, New York Times bestsellers, The Conscious Parent and The Awakened Family, which... I was saying before that I wish I had grown up in, which I didn't, and I don't know how many of you out there listening have grown up in an awakened family, but I bet not too many, and if you want to learn how to create one, you should listen in. So welcome, Dr. Shafali. Thank you so much for having me. So, um, you know, as a parent, you, you often don't know the consequences of your behavior for things that might seem you know, insignificant to you, but might have a huge impact on your kids. And uh, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to sit with my kids uh, with a friend of mine who's a life coach, uh, Lauren Zander, and to sort of go through their stories, my story, to sort of understand each other differently and to sort of share what, what were the things that needed healing or resolving. And, you know, one of the things that came up was that, you know, I I said to, um, once to my daughter, I got remarried and she wasn't happy about it. And I said, well, this is my life and I get to choose. Now I thought that was the right thing to say at the time, but it turns out that it made her feel like what she felt didn't matter Mm -hmm. and that she was on her own. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have that intention, but this was an unintended consequences. And so it's sort of a minefield of, or I said to my son once, you know, why can't you sort of study like your sister? And it made right. him have this whole right. complex yeah, thing. Yes. And I'm like, I, it wasn't, it, it wasn't intended right. to sort of destroy of him, course. but it, it really had a negative impact. Of so course. Um, I didn't really mean to hurt them, um, but it stayed with them. And, you know, how as a parent, can we talk to our children so we don't damage them? You know, I often say to people, how do you be a good parent? Well, your kids come into the world as these beautiful beings who are basically undamaged and your job is to stay out of the way and not screw them up. Right, right. So how do you do do that? Well, first you let go of the fantasy that you're not going to damage your kid. Okay, good. Like, and, and, (laughs) and I don't even want to use the word damage. You're just going to put all your stuff. This is just the way of the human experience. So when I write a book called The Awakened Family, people may be fooled to think that it's this perfect family that's not what this book is about and and it's it's it takes deep reading and deep understanding to realize what this book is about it's really about growing together evolving together and becoming authentic together so that process is murky messy chaotic it causes damage it causes heartbreak that is the human experience mm-hmm. but to understand that you're doing it in the moment and apply as much consciousness as possible. So what you did with your children is you allowed for that space for consciousness to now rise in mm-hmm. the midst of all the past unconsciousness. That's all we can do. We can keep allowing for consciousness to rise in the midst and awareness that we just effed it all up. But how do you so, do that? I mean, it's easy to say, let consciousness come up, but right. most of us walk around pretty unconscious. Right. So most of us are not on a path of spiritual awakening. Most of us have been deluded to believe that the material world of form is it. We go to work, we make money, we drive a car, we see a few friends, we eat, we sleep, rotate. and Rinse and repeat. Right. <laughs> and there are many of us who have broken out of that paradigm and that cycle to ask deeper questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? And those spiritual seekers begin to realize that there's this world of form, yes, but we don't need to be limited by this world of form. And then we begin to penetrate all the things that culture has oppressed us with Mm. all the ways we think we should be and all the myths we've followed and Mm. all these institutions we've been buried under and we begin to break free and deconstruct and let go so what you did with your children is you took a pause because you're on the spiritual path of healing and you said you know i have to create a space to reconnect and reevaluate and reemerge in oneness Mm -hmm. and you came from compassion you came from a desire of of healing and abundance. Mm. So a spiritual warrior realizes that there's the world of form that we can get mired and deluded by. And then there's this other way of living, which is a sense of abundance, oneness, healing, uh, emergence, constant seeking connectivity. So as long as we have that desire 
And we see our children, for example, as uh, ushers to that greater calling. Then we'll always realign. We'll mess up. Just yesterday, my daughter told me how she believes I don't like her. <laughs> right? And you don't like me and you're mean and only you're only one half of a mother, but you're not the other nice half. And, and I had to listen. Yeah. But I came from a space of abundance, healing, oneness, and, and how old ego. is she, a teenager? She's 15 and a half. She's oh, just go. a total nightmare. So, um, <laughs> I always tell my patients that don't worry, anytime between like 13 and 18, your kids are going through a period of temporary psychosis yes. and don't pay attention to The aliens now. and they'll come back and, and then you'll suddenly say, where were you all this time? <laughs> but in that process, they'll massacre you, you know, yeah, and yeah. that's okay. So again, if you're a spiritual warrior and you understand you're on the spiritual journey with your children to mm-hmm. evolve, then you won't react. You won't get egoic. You won't get personal. You won't enter lack as much, Mm -hmm. right? As much. So yesterday when she told me how I was a mean mother and I'm not this and I'm not that, I'm not, 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 not. I could see the rise of my ego to say, but I am, but I am, but I am. But like you did with your children, I was, because I've done work, I could allow the space to hear it, her experience, and connect to her and then offer her something she needed versus what I thought she needed. And this is the constant dance of the spiritual experiment of this life. So it's paying attention to your kids for who they are rather than who you want them to be. And All of life, right? Yeah. Paying attention to every moment as it is versus how we want it to be. This is the disconnect, right? Mm-hmm. We expect, we want, we then project, we rage, we react because it's not what we want it to be. Spiritual uh, teachings, wisdom teachings train us mm. to first accept the isness of the isness. It is here. She says she doesn't like you. Now let's connect. Yeah. Right? We go deep into the isness of the moment and don't resist it. So how do you do that? I mean, you're a parent. Your kid's saying all this horrible stuff to you. But it's not horrible. See, we well, judged it. You've judged okay. it. All right. But she says you're a terrible parent. You were, you, you, it's her experience. Yeah. So if we can enter the isness, very hard to do. I'm acting like I'm so zen. Well, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, like, so how it's do very you, you know, hard. Like... First, you have to deconstruct. Deconstruct it all. So first, the judgment that I'm calling it horrible. And this could be her putting it on me or me putting it on her. She gets a C grade. He gets a C grade. You say, oh, my God, my kid's going to have a horrible future. Yeah. Right. Or she's making me feel horrible because we immediately enter prophesizing prophetic omens of lack. Yeah. This is our default. What is our default? Lack. Mm -hmm. I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. It's not good enough. We're not going to be good enough. We're failing. I'm a failure. I'm full of shame. This is the default. It's yeah. predictable. It's ubiquitous. It's really quite simple. It's quite... So how it's, do you unhook from that? Like, yeah. it sounds like a great idea. I want to be like that. Well, first, you have to commit to a spiritual path that uh. you do even want to recognize, become aware, deconstruct, and transcend. If you're not even wanting that, you can't do it. And right? it's different you're talking about than a traditional religious practice or a religion. Yeah, yeah. This has nothing to do with religion. I'm okay. sorry. Because religion, too controls through a little bit of guilt tripping and lack and fear Mm -hmm. let's be real about it you know if you don't then you will and then it's prophetic omens about the future Mm -hmm. and a little bit of control you know somebody on top and the big one and yeah it's all about duality in many ways good bad evil heaven hell no wisdom traditions are about accepting the isness of the the way of the Tao. you know the way that reality flows Mm. and entering it with surrender. You can fight the river or you can go with it, right? Yeah, yeah. So wisdom traditions have nothing to do with an institutionalized practice or dogma or scripture. It's about going within, deconstructing your beliefs, your past, your present moment resistances, and transcending them. It's about deconstructing the mind. It's breaking free within the mind. But it's not just intellectual. You you work with patients using practical tools to help them understand right I, I teach them how the way. mind is full of resistant blocks and then i show them how psychologically they've been buried under so i i traditionally look at people as uh, evolving across a spectrum of four layers so one are the the 99.9 percent that are mired in form and the material so i call it the material level like most of us are just zombies reactive in sleepwalking in the material level like mm. I said, just concerned about eating, sleeping, m- making money, looking good. Uh, who do I belong? Where do I belong? Who are my friends? And rinse and repeat, right? That's their world. It's about mm-hmm. money, very mm-hmm. material, mm-hmm. 
superficial, mm-hmm. but they're enraptured by it and they truly believe that that's who they are because mm-hmm. they haven't awoken yet or awakened yet. The next level is a psychological level where, they, where people begin to ask, who am I? And pain begins to send them to the, to the therapist, to the, to the seeking path. Like, let me ask for some help. I'm drowning. So mm. pain is a great portal to snap people out of the material. It's mm. usually bad health. That's what I said. People don't change until they have any P syndrome. Absolutely. Well, not enough pain makes people avoid Absolutely. change, right? Pain is it. So, so I have often told my patients, go back, come back when you're in more pain. Because obviously this pain is not enough. It's a little bit, you complain, but you stay in the washing machine. When the pain is greater, come back. I just tell them, don't come now. You're wasting your time. You're not ready. You no. just, you're just wasting your time spinning, you know? So pain catapults us from the material into the psychological to ask, who am I? Am I really? Maybe it's me. And we go to a therapist. But then we have a tendency to get stuck there too. Yeah. And just go on and on. Like, well, my mother, my father. And I'm a therapist, so it's not Yeah, you on. mentioned that before about yeah, the you, challenges of therapy. Yeah, because therapy is also traditionally rooted in uh, ways of being that regurgitate the past. And as long as we stay stuck in the past, we have a, it's a trap. We can keep blaming and being victimized by our victim status and our mother and our father and, mm-hmm. and just, it's a whirlpool. And, you uh, can deeply understand the story and the why, but you don't change. But you don't change. And, in, and, and you, you espouse and you engender a victim mentality. Mm-hmm. You stay there. Yeah. You know, you, <laughs> you don't know then. So you're saying people shouldn't go to therapy? Well, I think it's, it's the inevitable first step breakthrough after the material mm-hmm. subjugation. You have to go to therapy. Then after th- you've done therapy and you realize, okay, deconstructed the past, I've stayed in the past, I've recognized where my traditional belief systems come from, where my fear was birthed. Mm-hmm. And now few go to the next realm, which is the spiritual which is I want to master my mind. Mm. I realize that I'm a co-creator of my reality. Mm. I see interconnectedness, but I can't understand it. And then you begin to meditate and you begin to spend time in quietude and solitude and truly go deep within Mm -hmm. and and learn to have a communion with your truth. You begin that deeper contemplative process. Mm. And then the fourth layer is the transcendental layer. But where, you need help to do that, right? I mean, you can't just sort of sit by yourself. And, no, you, you need help. You need yeah. help. Yeah. yeah, I had help. I had tremendous help. I went to spiritual teachers, wisdom books, read voraciously, and also helped myself. Yeah, so you have to be self-initiating. You have to want this. That's why when I see people are not ready... Um, I, it's no knock on them. They're just not ready. They don't mm-hmm. have to be ready. Mm-hmm. But it's a choice between one kind of living and another kind of living. And it's distinct. And you can define and identify people based on their propensity. They're mm. either here or they're here. Mm-hmm. And then the transcendental level is where you've truly understood that the mind is conditioned. We live in a deeply conditioned world predicated on lack and fear. And that mind truly seeks to liberate out of enslavement, its own enslavement. Mm. And that mind is uh, the true rebel or the warrior and the liberator, but also the lover, the compassionate Mm -hmm. person who proposes oneness and sees the world on an elevated level and and takes people toward that light. So how do you practically help your patients? You say, you know, start meditating. Is there a technique? Is there... Yeah, a first I first thought, I always say yeah. first people need to recognize where they are at. Not everyone can meditate. Not everyone can go for therapy. So I first pay homage to where is my client on these four levels. Mm. And most people are on the material. So I help them mm. on the material. They only need help strategically because they're so mired in form. Mm. And then I slowly begin to show them how they they are creating their own patterns. And then when you begin to show people their patterns in therapy, they begin having aha moments. Wow, I'm just like my mother was, or I am projecting onto my daughter all the things that my mother projected onto me. Mm-hmm. No knock on mothers, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that, begin- was, that was a way my friend who's a life coach used to really help me stop and think, which she said, you sound like your mother. And I'm like, oh, because my mother you know, tended to be on the negative side and yeah. tend to look at things and, you know, not always the bright side of life, yeah. shall we say. And uh, I developed that same habit. Sure. And it was like jarring when I would actually see it 
because it was told to me in a way that wasn't blaming or accusing or sure. judgmental. It was just like kind of funny and joking. But I was like, oh, okay, I get it. Oh, it's and I don't want to be that way. Right. There's nothing to be uh, judgmental about. It is the way <laughs> to inherit the patterns we absorbed in childhood. We are all living patterns, not lives. We are a pattern. Mm -hmm. So it's when you awaken that you break the pattern and disrupt mm. the pattern. But if you're not on the path of awakening, you are living a pattern. Okay, so let's let's dig into some practical stuff because we all were kids. We yes. all had parents and yes. many of us are parents, are going to be parents. And we all dream and hope the best for our children. And it doesn't always turn out great. So as you were writing this book, The Conscious Parent, and in your work... Mm -hmm. You know, what are the lessons, that, the sort of little nuggets of wisdom that you can share with people who are listening about how do we become a conscious parent? And what does actually that mean? And yeah. what is an unconscious parent? Yeah. So it, this is not about things turning out great. So we abandon all. Oh, yeah. okay. All this, right. <laughs> because what is great? Mm. Right? Is the, is, so Shaka Senghor, who's coming to my conference, mm. Evolve, he was incarcerated. Was that so bad? Because now look where he is. Mm -hmm. So we put judgment on experiences based on our very conditioned minds. Yeah. And this book, I hope, or my books, uh, totally take the roof off all conditioned labels. There is no good or bad. There is no uh, well, Your book isn't success. called The Unconscious Parent. No, it's called The, con <laughs> conscious, so the conscious Parent. Parent realizes that they've been living in a conditioned world, mm -hmm. that culture has dictated how they should feel, think, believe, and that's not true. It's not true that a successful child is one who is obedient. It's not true that a good child is compliant. It's not true that uh, a child who gets A grades will be a success in the future. It's mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. yeah. So many, many CEOs are dyslexic. Yes. And did terrible in school. But we've but cookie, they think laterally. Right, we've cookie cuttered our existence to survive, but it's all based on fear. So a conscious parent is the parent who begins to realize how conditioned they are by their own childhoods and culture, and they do not wish to impose this on their children as much as possible. Like some, some default damage is going to happen just by the human-to-human -human experience. But so in my life, for example, I'm ever watchful of the dumping I'm about to always do. And I minimize it and I mitigate mm -hmm. it. I don't always succeed, yeah. but I'm always watchful. What's my stuff? What's her stuff? Yeah. Who is she truly to the most organic uh, core that I can distill her to? Can I truly see her without my screens? Mm -hmm. This is the endeavor. It's not perfection. It's mm. not the destination. It's the endeavor. So how do you, how do, you do that? I, By I, having a spiritual practice of mm, mindfulness. So mm. meditation is the only way anyone on a spiritual path can not lose their mind is through my So you think we should all meditate? I, if I could give one law and one dic dictate out of my place of tyranny, it would be everyone. The tyranny should, of meditation? The tyranny of meditation. <laughs> Breathe. Close your eyes right now. <laughs> yes, I would do it with glee. Yeah. Yes, because... The practice of sitting with yourself, confronting your own mind and realizing the wisdom that your thoughts are not you. Mm -hmm. They're just impulses mm -hmm. constantly being stimulated by your, the noise around you and by your own generation of, of mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. But it's not the true you. The you begin to realize in meditation that there's a you that's beyond the thoughts. Yeah. And you're the witnesser of your thoughts. And as you go deeper and deeper into meditation, you realize there's even an awareness of the person who was just aware of the thoughts. And you go deeper mm -hmm. and deeper mm -hmm. to realize that. Who's the watcher watch, watching the watcher? Yeah, well, who's exactly, watching the watcher? <laughs> exactly. So then you. To quote Dr. Seuss. <laughs> right. And then you disconnect and you detach from this egoic hold of mm -hmm. I am my thoughts and I mm -hmm. am my feelings. And then you can live in a space of greater spaciousness and awareness. Because well, a training of the mind, really. Right, because we have exactly. these minds that are so Minding undisciplined mind. and exactly conditioned, conditioned, conditioned. habitually right. addicted based on childhood, well, automatic ways of being, right? Based on and childhood thinking. patterns and cultural conditioning, and you want to deconstruct that. So, when you say meditation, is it a particular kind? Is it mantra meditation? Is it breath meditation? Is it vipassana meditation? Yeah, is I it... do vipassana, um, 
but that's just what I do. And mm. everyone has their own portal in, mm. and it's all to be respected. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the Buddha talks about true nature or bodhicitta, which is a sort of clear mm-hmm. mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and uh, you know, who are you beyond your thoughts mm-hmm. and your conditioned mm-hmm. self and your experiences? And, you know, I studied in college, my major was Buddhism and uh, Eastern religions, and I practiced, you know, meditation and yoga. And it was very impactful for me to begin to sort of differentiate, you know, my uh, sort of conditioning, emotional reactions, automatic ways of being, and sort of to realize that there's a, there's a being that's not all of that. It's not my thoughts, not my emotions, not my behaviors, not my physical self. And I recently had a, a profound experience, not that I would wish it on anybody, but I got really sick right. over a year ago and um, my physical body completely collapsed. I'm, you know, 185 pounds, six foot three, and I lost 30 pounds. So mm-hmm. I was, I'm already pretty skinny and I was really, really skinny. Mm-hmm. Uh, I couldn't focus on anything. My mind was completely gone. I could mm-hmm. just basically watch Netflix or HBO mm-hmm. Go and that was it and sit in bed. Uh, emotionally, I wasn't really available. Mm-hmm. Um, physically, I wasn't available. Mentally, I wasn't available to myself. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that I knew was true was that there was some being, entity, true nature, something, whatever you call it, that was abiding through all of that. Mm-hmm. And I actually was completely at peace and surrendered, even though I didn't know if I was going to die. Mm-hmm. I, I was really close to death. And I, and it was being in that experience that sort of reinforced the view that, you know, none of the noise matters right yeah. that 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 just connecting into that place of who you are allows you to live a more authentic life so yeah. let's talk about authentic life because you you write a lot about it you speak mm-hmm. a lot about it uh i don't know if people know what that means how do you live an authentic life how do you be your authentic self what mm-hmm. does that mean but mm-hmm. for me that experience you know even though i said when i was younger had a lot of those experiences it just it just sort of reinforced a shift in the way I want to show up in the world, how I want to relate to people, how I want to treat myself, the work I want to do, mm-hmm. what matters, what doesn't matter. Like mm-hmm. things that used to upset me don't upset me anymore. Right. And it, it's just like right. so easy to go through life You just now. clean the, the, you know, all the cobwebs and yeah. you could see clearly who you need to be because you stop buying into the fear that you are who others think you need to be. Yeah. Right. You just let all of that go. Because you came down to your elemental core of you may die, so you better live the truest way you could because there's no time to waste. Yeah, not everybody has that experience though. I mean, I think people, I've been with many people dying and they still are in their patterns right up to the moment of death. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, so, because many of us have grown up with so much pain that we created all these barriers against pain. Mm-hmm. But those barriers now obstruct our true self. Mm-hmm. So those people who, even death doesn't break the shell, It's because they're just, they were so defended all their life Mm -hmm. against pain Mm -hmm. that they just can't let go of their identities. Yeah. You know, and we, this is what we do in life to, to ward off pain from others. We become who they want us to be. We, or we rebel against it, just one or the other. Yeah. But what we don't become is non-labeled or non-judged or just spacious awareness, which is what children really are and they live in yeah. that space they don't know whether they're boy or girl or african-american or caucasian uh, or pretty or they learn that right mm-hmm. through a conditioning and they become that identity and that label i'm married i'm smart i'm athletic i'm a jock i'm a mm-hmm. theater kid i'm mm-hmm. a geek mm-hmm. god there's so many labels so as we keep putting on labels and holding on to them because we believe that's who we are in order to be in the world we go further and further away from spacious awareness and moving with fluidity and flow because we're always uh, quagmired by the role. The role of husband, the role of wife, the role of parent. That becomes its own crazy, tenacious uh, identification. Mm. Many parents screw up not because they're really not smart or not wise. It's because they so want to be a good parent, right? But yeah. there's a whole trap there because yeah. they want, they want, I want, so I want to be a good parent. It's all identification with a role versus just being present for who your kid is. Yeah, that's an important statement you just said, being present for who your kid is, because they may not be who you want them to be or who you dream for them to be. And I think a lot of cultures, I mean, I'm Jewish tradition, I mean, there's a sense of, 
you know, performance and achievement, you know, success, achievement, you know, right. so the, uh, a friend Hard of mine who's, who's a, a, yeah. you know, Indian, very successful Indian businessman talked about how he's raising his kids and pushing them to be, you know, at this level of excellence, you know, that was just, I thought was kind of intimidating if I was his kid. Oh, sure. <laughs> and yet, you know, he thought that was the best thing to do for them. Because sort of... he's so conditioned mm -hmm. by the artifice of success. Yeah. But we all have been seduced by this. Mm. And so then to not do that means we're failing as a parent. Mm. That's why I said you have to make a choice. You either go the conditioned way and get mired in it and get enraptured in it, or you realize that it's all creating a false self. It's really not who it is we are or need to be. Our children don't need to follow this. They need to follow their own inner calling. And a life lived even on the street but to one's inner calling, mm -hmm. to me, to me, is a more worthwhile life than a false life lived in a gilded ca castle. Yeah, you know? no, it's so true. Yeah. Um, so how do you how do you still meet the sort of sort of innate thing that a parent wants the kids to do their best uh, and be their best without sort of being authoritarian or? Yes sort of controlling right, right. this is the question the I always get parent, asked right. how can I make my kid be implicitly motivated <laughs> but you know how can I make them be implicitly motivated right. Right? right you know we're so insane we parents you know so we try to not push but we're full of pushing energy yeah we're full of controlling energy mm. because we're deeply afraid and this is where the conscious parent may differ because they've done the work to confront their fear They've surrendered their expectations of their fantasies being met via their children. They've said, you know, my child is not here to meet my needs. My child is not here to fulfill my fantasies. I got to go do that on my own. Mm -hmm. My pain cannot be solved by my child. Mm -hmm. I cannot use my child to rescue me. Yeah. So the conscious parent fully sees the, the separation of the two paths. And in that, can really see the oneness of the two spirits, you see? Mm -hmm. When we're enmeshed, we think we're one, but yeah. we're not. We're just enmeshed. Well, sort of, Kihil Braun talks about how we sort of are just here as stewards of our yes. kids. We're, yes, <laughs> They're not, we don't own them, we don't control right. them. But there's a you delusion know, they, because they come from us, they bear our name or we give them our name, and so we own them and we possess them. But yeah. that's the delusion. Yeah. And then we're eternally dissatisfied, disappointed, despondent. Our children grow up with shame. The child is like, what have I done? Yeah. And it's the even, parent is, what have you not done today? Right. You know? And it's even in the language of some traditions, like in the Jewish tradition, in the Hebrew naming of somebody, you say, you are so-and-so the son of. Yes. You know, I just came back you from belong. the Middle East. And yes. You're so and so, the son of this one, the son of that one, the son of this one, and that one. It's like no pressure. You know, you're yeah. like the son of like ten generations, and so. But then you identify with yeah. it. Of course, you're the son biologically. Of course, there's a biological yeah. element. But we're doing something else. We're trying to tie people, uh, both to the tradition of a lineage, but also we're telling them there's expectations that come with this. Yeah. Right. So how do we allow children to be part of tribes and families? but without the bondage of the expectation that comes with that lineage. Hmm. And you, you've said in an interview before that, that um, you teach your daughter to question everything, mm -hmm. which is sort of the opposite of telling them what to do, right? Right. Um, why is that important? Well, I don't believe that our children should be, you know, obedient little robots. I believe they should be questioning even irreverent at times, beings, because there is a lot of crazy out in culture. There is a lot of insanity. So if my child doesn't see it, I would have a problem with it. I'm like, mm -hmm. do you see how crazy? Mm -hmm. So in doing that, though, we do raise rebels, right? Mm -hmm. We do raise somebody who speaks out and we'll call you crazy. So like my daughter said yesterday, Mom, you, you. Right, right. You have to take that with the whole experience, yeah. right? You're raising a child who can see through uh, the inauthentic nature of the conditioned culture. And mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Yeah. But the parent would be threatened if they haven't done that work themselves. Yeah, no, I remember my daughter when she was like eight, maybe. She said, Daddy, how come what you see on TV and like all the advertising, right. actually when you see it in real life, isn't actually what 
it seems it like on is. TV. Yes. And I'm like, wow, that is a very smart little girl. Right. And she is beginning to notice and question the discrepancy between what the culture was telling her and what yeah. the truth was. And it's, it's a difficult process to awaken because to recognize that what culture has been selling you is a big sale and a big lie. Mm predicated again on fear and mass control it's scary to realize wow i was raised my whole life believing that if i was successful and if i was wealthy i would be happy yeah and that was a lie yeah that's true that was a lie that's disorienting you dedicate your whole life to success and achievement and wealth and then you're still not happy that feels mm -hmm. like you've been ripped <laughs> off yeah but this is where we the conscious parent would do it differently would realize that nothing external can ever create happiness mm. it's an internal endeavor well let's talk about something really important that i think affects so many people and you know when i when i raised my kids it was pre-internet pre-social media in fact uh until my son was in the eighth grade uh my daughter a little older we didn't have television right um, and the only reason I got it was because he liked basketball. <laughs> yeah. And and so we read, we played, we did things outside. They got to experience life. We grew gardens. Uh, they got to have an authentic, tangible experience. We cooked together. And today, I see you know little babies on iPads. I see kids completely distracted. I see the electronic babysitter everywhere. Mm -hmm. I see the data now coming out about how this affects kids' brains and development and ability to connect and have authentic relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had this explosion of social media, which is almost a, in a way, an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. It's anything but social, mm -hmm. right? It's it disconnecting. It's mm -hmm. you think you're having the experience mm -hmm. of being connected. In fact, it's not really authentic. People really not need Facebook. They need FaceTime. And mm -hmm. I don't mean on the iPhone. I mean, like, right. literally authentic relationship how do, how do you counsel parents to deal with this ubiquitous penetration of social media and it's even worse than than traditional media or tv because it's it's ubiquitous it's everywhere portable it's it's portable and it's also manipulative in ways that other media wasn't you knew you were seeing Absolutely. an ad before for whatever right. now you're seeing you know embedded things stealth right. advertising celebrity advertising yeah. and people think it's authentic and it's just not yeah. so how do you how do you help parents deal with yeah, this? Yeah, it's a big, big mess. And there is no easy answer. And really, I hope one day we'll wake up and throw all our iPhones away. But of course, we won't. We'll become more automated and more robotic mm -hmm. till we have a natural demise, you know, because that's where we're heading. It's becoming increasingly disconnected, mechanized. And it's, it, it is alarming. I try not to get into fear about it because it's the way of the the 99%. So mm -hmm. it's the way of the way. Mm -hmm. But now what? Now what? So it takes a lot of gumption for the parents to create connectivity, create playtime. You know, I don't believe I did it differently. Do because we restrict it for our kids? Do we let them have it? Or well, I think they, go, they if, sleep on their you know, phone? If I had to do it again, I, I, I was the first generation yeah. really to see it. Yeah. So I succumbed because I was so seduced by it. And yeah. it was such a bauble and a trinket. And I was yeah. like, I want my own iPhone. Yeah. Right. So we didn't know. We didn't know what a cesspool this was mm -hmm. and what a riptide it had. So now, being aware, I tell parents, no screens till teens. You know, just don't do it. Try not to do it. The TV is so much more benevolent. We used to complain about the TV. I'm all for the TV now because the kid can't take it to the bathroom. The kid can't take it to the car. You have the remote control. That you was get him so, a flip phone. <laughs> get them a flip phone. So, But the parent has to be willing to A, create greater connective experiences, but we we find it so, uh, you know, addictive because it allows us to not be parents. Mm -hmm. You know, you said it's an electronic babysitter. So it's going to take a lot of gumption for parents to create connectivity and then create healthy boundaries. No very screens till teens. Wow. Very <laughs> difficult because the parent themselves are now addicted yeah. and we are distracted mm -hmm. and we just, we just lost our way now. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, there's a whole movement around digital detox. And yes. Detox camps where people go for the weekend sure. and just put away their phones. I went to a wedding, it was an actually Indian wedding the other, the other weekend, and it was the request was everybody put their phones away yeah. and people show up. And it was, yeah. was it just an amazing experience. I mean, I, yeah. I grew up in the era where there were no cell phones, yeah. there was no internet, there was just people. Mm -hmm. And I found... Um, it very enticing to be engaged in the same kind of mm -hmm. interactivity and I do it for work and I am always on it and it's 
a, something I struggle with, but I, I've gotten better and better about like having mm-hmm. safe times where you mm-hmm. can disconnect. And I, I bought my wife a little box for our anniversary. It was mm-hmm. this little wooden box. And she's, oh, that's a nice little box. I said, that's not the present. The present is I put my phone in the box for the weekend. Yeah. And I give you the gift of my presence. Yeah. And I thought I was doing it for her. Yeah, it's really but for you. it was like, I had the best time because I yeah. wasn't constantly looking at my phone, checking my email, looking at yeah. texts. I literally could just be present. I could listen to music. I yeah. could just daydream. Yes. I could play with the cat. I mean, yes. whatever, whatever. Was yeah, just and I don't think it's necessarily the phone. It's what we're doing on the phone, right? Mm-hmm. So if if we're listening to music on the phone or reading a book on the phone or or really connecting, you know, some sometimes we need to connect to people. Of course, those are those are not the mindless distractions that succumb us to endless hours of addiction. It's it's this constant need to be on Facebook to mm. see what other people are doing. It's really that that's mindless. The prying into other people's lives and wanting people to to validate yourself through Instagram and and Facebook that's the addiction. Yeah. If you're reading an article on the New, on the New York Times website that may be good for you. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with reading, with learning, but it's this vapid part of social yeah. media that's alarming to me, you know. And it, and it's interesting how it's designed to be addictive. Like it's not an accident yeah. the way they present the information, how yeah. it's because it's all visual, it's quick, you scroll, but you can spend 10 minutes and not know, and not have learned one. Or 10 hours. 10 like or not have learned one mm-hmm. positive thing. So what, how I do it is uh, to, to give myself boundaries, is I have all my favorite wisdom sites there, my po- favorite wisdom podcasts. So if I'm gonna be there, I'm going to be learning mm. and cultivating what about my your daughter? mind. No, my daughter's completely addicted to senseless, vapid activities, as most teenagers, like Snapchat, which is drives, I want to take the phone <laughs> and kill it. But I also know that she needs to find her way with it, because this is the culture. And I, I was a bad parent by giving her the phone. Mm-hmm. I didn't know. Yeah. So now I try to educate, but you can't control you know, yeah. you, I, I don't want to do anything out of an imposition or an oppression. I wanted to do from the, uh, I want the child to awaken to it themselves. Yeah. So then I become more of a jewel, you know, come, come to me. Let's go hiking. Let's go out. Sure. So I connect more. Great experiences. Great experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, I, I, the new iPhone software has the ability to track the screen time. Yeah. And the hours, which I think would be a fascinating experiment for people to do for themselves, where, where, and also for where parents they were to do with on kids. the on the media, where they were. Where they, well, it, yeah, so it tracks your usage in yeah. a way that's uh, much yeah. more transparent. Yeah. And you go, wow, I spent like four hours on scrolling it. on Facebook today. Yeah. I mean, what a waste of time! I could have been yeah. learning something or talking to a friend. Yeah. Or, you know, it's just, I think it's going to be interesting, and I I would love to sort of have a way of tracking my kids and my niece my nephew and seeing like what yeah. what is actually happening i mean i remember when i was well, this was still when they had like the flip phones uh, i got them for my kids and they were in junior high just so i could you know have ability to contact them and uh i got the bill for uh my phone and they're like like two thousand text yeah. messages crazy and I calculated how many text messages a day, a minute. Right, and I'm like, right. what are you doing in school all day? Yeah. You know, 2,000 text messages. Yeah. You know, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And, and I would still say texting to friends is still different. It's still at least an attempt at virtual sure. connection. Sure. But it's that, that mindless scrolling yeah. and posting yeah. and needing validation. Yeah that's the psychological abyss that people are in and they don't realize. They're doing it for this hunger, this craving, yeah, this see me. me, see me. And it's not the real self that they it's are never, presenting. It's never. It's all right? edited and right. and photoshopped. And that's what I... The texting to friends is still connection. Mm-hmm. Connect. Yeah. You know, well, it's 2, okay. 2,000 times a month, I don't know. <laughs> that, but that's still, it's an attempt at connection. Mm. It's the, the complete self-absorption and the other absorption that that I'm talking about, where you're so invested in other people's lives and so measuring your own life in comparison, that is the pitfall, the psychological pitfall. Hmm. Okay, let's talk about something else, which um, is death. Okay. Something people don't like to talk about, think about. Yeah. But uh, you sort of talk about death as a, an opportunity to actually mm-hmm. be more engaged in life mm-hmm. and have a more authentic mm-hmm. life. Can you mm-hmm. talk about that? 
Well, you know, we're, we're really dying all the time. So I don't know why people are so, so scared of the final form death. Mm. But we've already had form deaths. We've already died. Our infant self died. Our toddler self died. Our adolescent self died. Our, our, our romantic selves with many partners died. We're constantly evolving. So death is, is. It's not something mm. to be afraid of. If you're going to be afraid, now stop, contemplate, and be afraid that you've already died so many times. So it's the final, the final uh, apparent physical death that we're afraid of. But that also is not the end of the end. It's a, it's a constant transformation. Mm. Where does that energy go? It's got to go somewhere. I don't know where, whether it's going to be incarnated or in an, in an, in a uh, form of bio, a biological being like compost a flower, else, compost, right? <laughs> bacteria, but it's going to transform. Sure. So we've already seen evidence of that in our own lives, right? We've already transformed. Mm -hmm. The death already transformed into a new spaciousness. So the fear again is because we don't understand the nature of our selves and mm. how life evolves and so we have fear so we live in fear and then in that fear we don't really live mm -hmm. so if i'm just really curious about this book the awakened family because um it's something that i definitely aspired to failed at <laughs> yeah wished i came from yeah um and the subtitle is how to raise empowered resilient conscious children yeah which is what we all want yeah so can you sort of break it down for us? What are yeah. the practical steps? Because we've been talking, you know, yeah, about big ideas. Yeah. But let's talk about some of the practical ways that yeah. you can begin to create an awakened family with the notion that it will never be perfect. Yeah. Right. But that what are the things that we yeah. can learn and that yeah. you've learned through working with yeah. families and so parents? So I'll just and outline kids? a couple. So one is that an awakened self or an awakened family is endeavoring to be authentic. So we are always waiting for the child to unfold in their self-expression. So, for example, I didn't do any structured activities with my child till she was six because I was waiting for her to tell me, what. how do I know whether she likes horse riding or parachute? You didn't get jumping, her practicing the piano or, at two years old, no? <laughs> or play, learning Mandarin or parasailing. I didn't know, so I'm waiting because I wanted to be authentic to her. <laughs> So that's very hard for parents, yeah. is to match it to who the child is showing and revealing themselves to be. Because mm -hmm. we're in some hurry, and the age of six was already too late. She couldn't join any group activity. She ended up only doing tennis and horse riding because those were the solo activities, because she was so behind the curve, Mark. Yeah. Isn't that insane at six? So first to show parents the insanity, and then to show them that it's about authenticity. Mm. This is not about a family that all does everything together and everyone believes the same things. It's about each one being authentic. So the parent has to be able to withstand that, right? Like a child wants to explore Hinduism, but the family's, uh, you know, uh, Muslim or, or no, no religion. You know, how is the parent going to truly live up to that value of authenticity? Very mm. few parents can. They say mm. they want to, but no one can. The second thing is to let go of ideations of good and bad. Right? There is no good child, there is no bad child. Every child is endeavoring to be their most revealing self. And if they can't, it's because we haven't created the conditions. So the parent always turns the spotlight within. How is this moment showing up for me to evolve? What does this say about my childhood wounds? What does this say about my projection? So the mm -hmm. daring parent is always turning it around to, let me examine myself. Let me detach from my expectations. Let me release my control. Let me surrender. Let me attune to what my child is really saying. Mm. So constant practice. Letting go of good and bad. Mm. I don't know what's good. I don't know what's bad. I only know what is. Mm. What is. Mm. And allowing my child to have their life's experience. If they need to be lost a little bit, that's their life experience. How can I find their way for them. Mm -hmm. Lostness is part of the human experience. It's so hard to do. Hard to do as a parent, right? Hard to do because we're believing we need to lead our children to success. Or that we're in control. On, and <laughs> we're in control. The spiritual parent, conscious parent, understands there is no control. There's no one to lead. There's no future. It's all in the present. There's no good or bad. It's all conditioned. Mm. It's only the self that needs to be raised. So how do you teach that in a family? I mean, you, you say in terms of 
family values. What do you, these are our family values. We believe we should be authentic. We should be well, honest. Well, you're we lucky if you have a spouse who's on the same page, yeah? Mm. So that's very rare. So you, you just basically, that's why I say it's all about one, any one parent who wishes to awaken, that's the family. One parent, one child. Mm. Don't wait for your mother-in-law. Don't wait for your siblings. Don't get permission from your parents mm. or your spouse mm. or your partner. This is about you. You awaken and you free your child. So are there practices or conversations or ways of sort of making this practical for people? Because it sounds like it's it's a yeah. hard thing to get you know get people's hands around. Right, because I, I think I'm being so practical, but I understand what you're saying. This is what people always say, give me the tools you didn't tell me. Because spiritual practice is not about cookie cutter tools mm. and, stra- and keys. Mm. You can't put it on a wall. It's a wisdom. It's a way of being. It's an enlightened mind. So, yeah, it's a tougher path because there are no golden strategies. Yeah. Because if I gave you golden strategies, it's against the teaching, right? Yeah. It's like then you, so you wake up your kid, then you smile five times and you give 10 compliments, <laughs> no, right. right? You can't. No, no, that's it. I'm thinking more, you know, like I studied Buddhism and, you know, it's interesting when you look at the way it is. It's not a religion. It's yes. a way of looking at Yes. the way the mind works yes. it's a i call it a phenomenology of the mind it's yes. a description of these these automatic patterns and what causes suffering and how yes. to undo them yes and so i think you know there are ways to teach that yes. i think there are ways to teach yes the break things down for people yes. say well your perception is this but here's yes. what the real story is and i think yes so every parent who wishes to do that needs to go on this path mm. The child is not responsible to free So it's us. not changing the child, it's changing yourself it's is what you're talking about. It's only changing yourself. Yeah. So you have to endeavor to go on this path. Like I said, extricate from the material, enter the psychological work and the terrain of deconstructing your childhood patterns, seeing that everything is a pattern, then going to the next step of learning meditation mm. and learning wisdom. It's a path that you have to follow if you wish to embody this as your life's purpose. Mm. Right. And then daring to break paradigms, daring to say, you know, I'm not afraid of telling someone that my kid failed. or I'm not afraid of saying "Um, I I didn't you know, I I was I made a mistake or I'm not a good parent in a conventional way or I lost my temper because I'm all about self-exploration. So when you have the right vibrational frequency of what your path is about, you start breaking paradigms. You yeah. start not caring or being so attached to what people think. Well, in Buddhism, it's interesting. You have the the concepts of the teaching, which is the wisdom teaching called the Dharma. Yes. The the importance of practice, mm-hmm. so self work, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and then the importance of community. They mm-hmm. call it the sangha. Those are right. the three pillars. Right. So you can't like do it on your own. Number one. Yeah. You, you need the understanding, right. the intellectual right. understanding of right. the nature of our thinking and our right. motions and our right. behaviors and our thoughts. And you also need the, the practice. Community. The so, practice. And the which practice. Is, so it's the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. These right. three are the, the, uh, the pillars of your practice and your path. So yeah. you, you attract that. You go for it. You invite it into your life. Mm-hmm. So you train your mind. You do the, the practice of it, the mindfulness, the meditation, the application. Mm-hmm. And you have to be surrounded by people who support that yeah. and who also are like-minded and like-hearted. Yeah. You cannot, you can do it on your own, but it takes a real maverick to do it on their own. It's true. We talk about eating right. We talk about exercise. We talk about getting sleep. But, you know, we need brain training because our minds are unstructured. They're undisciplined. That's the most essential thing in the world. It's is the, the thing mind. that creates happiness or suffering. Is the mind. It's not how many hours you exercise or how pretty yeah. you are or how buffed you are. It's, this is the birthplace of all suffering. Yeah. You yeah. Dec- and why? It's not really the birthplace. It is conditioned. So once you decondition, you're back to the mind's original nature, which is freedom. Yeah. The conditioned mind is the suffering mind. So once, you, and who are we conditioned by? Really just silly culture. Yeah. Once you see through culture, you realize it's really just a scared place yeah. of lack. And once you get out of it, because you don't wish to be part of lack and competition and fear anymore, you go back to the original nature of your mind, which is a free mind. So, so part of what you're saying is really learn some of the wisdom traditions, like learn how they've uncovered the patterns of the mind that cause suffering and yes. the ones that create happiness. Yes. And second, you're saying develop a practice. Develop a, a, develop a arduous, practice. arduous Just like commitment. you're going to work out and yes. do strength training. Yes. You know, how do you, yes. how do you do that? And I think 
personally, I've, you know, come into this, you know, 40 years ago, uh, left it for a while and have come back recently to a disciplined practice. I mean, I did yoga, I do breathing, I would do things, but it was very different when I started again to daily meditate. 20 yes. minutes twice a day. I was just in Abu Dhabi at Cleveland Clinic and the CEO there is this amazing guy who uh, is extremely high performing, has incredible vision, uh, is really focused. And I'm like, what's different about this guy? And, you know, by the end of our visit, he, he revealed to me that he's a regular meditator, that he does 30 minutes twice a day, that he follows a particular practice and it's helped him understand his mind, be less reactive be more authentic in his way of leading. I mean, it's really had this amazing impact. I mean, you and you see, it's not just kind of, you know, hippies and Birkenstocks yeah. doing this. You've got, for example, Seattle, Seattle uh, yeah. Seahawks were yeah. meditating why they won the Super Bowl. You've got yeah. Michael Jordan and his Chicago Bulls were all meditating under the uh, yes. instruction of, of the yeah. coach who wrote a yes. book called Sacred Hoops. Yes. Uh, and it was all about mm -hmm. the, I mean, Sacred Hoops, basketball, who's talking about spirituality yes. and sports, but it's really about the, the activity of training the mind. You're absolutely right. On a concrete level, it's this marriage, it's this commitment, it's this dedication to enlivening your mind and to mm -hmm. liberating your mind. But as I said in the beginning, people have to want it. Mm -hmm. And typically, it's not something we feed our children at school or we say you know, to our spouses, if you're not a meditator, can't marry you. It's not part of the <laughs> language. But we do see if our spouse has a good job, if they could look good, right? But this should be part of the chemistry mm -hmm. uh, and this should be part of the evaluations at school. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things with my, with my wife, we sit and meditate together yeah. and it's like such a yeah. great, and then we cuddle yeah. after, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's really about a worldview at the end of the day, mm -hmm. right? Understanding that we are conditioned and we want to be less conditioned. Yeah. We want to be more authentic. And it's, it's not just an emotional thing that happens when you meditate. There's a wonderful book I'm sure you're familiar with called Altered Traits by Daniel Goleman, who wrote Emotional mm -hmm. Intelligence, mm -hmm. and Richard Davidson, who's studied some of the yes. world's yes. most advanced meditators. Yes. You know, Tibetan monks yes. who've lived in a cave for nine years and have meditated the whole time. I mean, people have, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 hours of meditation, and their brains literally change. Yes. Uh, yes. The brain waves change. Yes. They're their creativity patterns right. change, their ability to have love and compassion changes. You are literally rewiring your entire inner terrain, mm. how your synapses join and connect, and you're, you're changing that, right? Mm -hmm. So like you were giving the example in our break of how you had this impulsive, quick uh, reaction based on a template from childhood. Yeah. Meditation can undo that, Yeah. but you have yeah. to just work at it through awareness, and the tool is awareness. Yeah. There's no real tool, physical tool. Yeah. It's the power of awareness. Yeah. So that's why all meditation teachers will say when you ask them a question, the first thing they'll say is first be aware, yeah. then sit with it, yeah. and then wait to see what unfolds, right? Because it's not something that is concrete. It's something that you have to go within and allow. Yeah, so true. And, and don't be scared that you have to meditate for 30 or 40,000 hours and live in a cave for nine right. years. The science is really clear that even people who do within a few weeks or months yes. see profound it's changes immediate. in the brain, the immune system, stem cell production. And you don't even have to sit there and do it. You can, you can wash dishes and breathe. You can drive a car and breathe. Mm -hmm. once you Make learn sure you how keep to, your eyes open when you're driving the right, car. Right. But <laughs> once, you, once you learn to center on the breath, which is really the most elegant tool of going inward, the Buddha said just focus on the breath which is what we're doing all day. We're breathing all day, but we're not aware. The breath brings you in the present moment. The breath is the intermediary between the external and the internal. The breath is impermanent. It teaches you the law of impermanence. The breath is transient. The breath is in the now. The breath is, uh, you know, in and out, right? So it's constantly making you go inward and outward. The breath is accompanying you everywhere. So you have no excuse to not be on the breath. And that, in essence, is meditation. You don't have to sit in a yogi position or in quiet. In fact, to be on the breath in the midst of Times Square and the traffic jam and the children pooping and screaming is the exalted application of mm -hmm. meditation. It's not about cocooning yourself and telling everybody, shh, right? So I teach meditation online and I do yeah. it uh, with online courses. And if the dog barks, I go see. Yeah, no, I meditate on airplanes right. exactly. and subways, exactly. subways. <laughs> right, because yeah. people think it's this yeah. very, you know, coveted, pedestalized 
phenomenon. Your perfect cushion, yeah, your perfect exactly. incense, and that's your another perfect attachment. candle. It's, your a, that, it's another attachment. Yeah. It's just about uh, being in the present. Uh-huh. So enter the present wherever you are. Yeah. yeah. That's powerful. Wow. So um, if you could if you could sort of be in charge for a day in the world, yes. you know, what, what would you suggest or create for people to wake up? Silence, quietude, solitude, breathe. Do it for 10 hours. Your enti- the entire world will change mm. because that will naturally create less reactivity, naturally lessen the ego, which is the cause of all strife and violence. Me, my identification to me and my views. Mm-hmm. And the minute you begin to meditate and see that your thoughts are just thoughts which are conditioned, then all your ideas like I'm a Muslim, I'm a Catholic, I'm tall, I'm better, I'm white, I'm black, dissolves. And then you realize, oh, we're all one. Mm-hmm. And we're all interdependent. So when I kill you, I kill myself. Mm-hmm. So no more. So it's the end of all conflict, strife, and violence. It's the beginning of love. It's the beginning of just this, this eternal oceanic dis- dissolved state called love. Yes. Amazing. Well, thank you, Dr. Shafali, for joining thank us in the Doctor's Dr. Pharmacy. Mark thank you so it's much. It's an amazing conversation. Uh, lots of food for thought. Um, You've been listening to the Doctor's Pharmacy with Dr. Shafali. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I encourage you to share this with your friends and family. If you like this podcast, be sure to give a review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next time on the yes. Doctor's Pharmacy. Thank you so much.